ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಕಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮುದಿಥೇನ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಎವ್ರಿಬಡಿ ಟು ಇಸ್ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಸಿಲಿಕನ್ ವ್ಯಾಲಿ ವಿ ಆರ್ ರಿಯಲಿ ಓವರ್ ಜೋಯ್ಡ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಏಬಲ್ ಟು ಪ್ರೊವೈಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಫೆಸಿಲಿಟಿ ಹಿಯರ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಮಿಡಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಸಿಲಿಕನ್ ವ್ಯಾಲಿ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಸಚ್ ಅ ಪ್ರೊಗ್ರೆಸಿವ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಯಾಲಿಫೋರ್ನಿಯ ಇನ್ ಜನರಲ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋನ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಡಿವರ್ಸ್ ಎಕನಾಮಿಕಲಿ ಕಲ್ಚರಲಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುಲಿ and also uh, open minded and to have represented here a uh, culture which is um has such a great legacy and tradition of over many many generations in fact according to the vedic tradition this is something that's been passed down since the beginning of time through a chain of uh, spiritual teachers and it is uh, non sectarian it's known as sanatan dharma that is literally what is common to to all living beings not just human beings but every living creature has an original source and also a purpose and discovering what that is helps to align one with one's purpose in life and that's what really brings happiness the idea of misery which in sanskrit is dukkha indicates a an axle that is out of alignment with the wheel and when you get this disalignment there's friction could be even fire the joints wear out quite rapidly and so forth and similarly when i'm out of alignment with my real purpose in life there's a way in which i feel worn out and discouraged shri chaitanya mahaprabhu who brought the vedic teachings to the world in such a practical way and according to the scriptures in the way that is specifically sp- prescribed for this age which is called kali yuga taught a way in which everyone everywhere from any walk of life it's not required to uh, be born in a in a particular place or time but everyone because everyone comes from a common origin from krishna as krishna says himself in the bhagavad gita mamai vam sho jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana that everyone is my part and parcel there's a way in which uh, when we do a few make a few slight alignments this duke diminishes we change not our environment or our circumstances but we change our consciousness changing our environment and changing our situation in life is not so easy there's an old saying when bengal used to be the seat of learning and good fortune people would migrate there from places all over the world and there was a saying in bengal is when you come to bengal you bring your fortune with you and of course there's a modern day buddhist saying that wherever you go there you are however when one changes one's consciousness which is your prerogative that's the the exciting aspect of this process everyone has the prerogative and ability to adjust their own consciousness you can't adjust others consciousness anybody has a spouse <laughs> or children <laughs> or a boss you can't necessarily adjust their consciousness you may be able to over time but you can adjust your own and of course every self help guru in the world will tell you it's not what happens to you that matters it's what you do about what happens to you that matters however what is the most substantial way in, in which to amend one's ways to align oneself with one's highest purpose in life so that one's consciousness is uh, perfectly in tune with the original divine source krishna the supreme personality of godhead 
This was Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings to everybody, and he gave very practical ways in which to do that. So, one of the ways, which is elusively simple, is to repeat the names of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. Because within the names of the Supreme, because he's an absolute entity, come all the powers of the Supreme. One's relationship with the Supreme can be reawakened simply by this repetition. Heartfelt repetition is especially effective. I was thinking this morning about how when you have a lack of something, when you have a need, then you have the wherewithal to ask for it. When you feel that you already have something, for instance, if you're full and someone asks you if you'd like something to eat, you'll decline. If you're starving and they say, would you like something to eat? You'll immediately agree. And it doesn't even matter if it's that nice. <laughs> if you're hungry, <laughs> you'll take it. So one of the, the great saints of the Bhagavatam, Kunti Devi, said that if one can realize one's existential need, that is, to f have a feeling of helplessness, which she gave uh, uh, in a word in Sanskrit as akinchana. Kinchana means I have something, I am something. And akinchana is a more realistic a view of how we're actually situated in this world, according to the Bhagavatam and according to Kunti, Devi, and that is I don't have anything. And if, if one chants with this realization that I'm needy and calls out the names of the Supreme, then the process will be immediately effective. Even if one doesn't have a clear idea who the Supreme is, and there's an example of this in the Srimad Bhagavatam with the elephant Gajendra. When we drive by Evernote, we always pay respects to Gajendra. Because right before, if you're coming south on 101, first you'll see the Buddha, and you can offer your respects. He's a beautiful deity of the Buddha. Have you seen him? He's right in front of a car lot. And then just after that, you'll see Gajendra, uh, the Evernote building, and you can offer your respects to him and also to Ganesh by re reciting, Yet para palavigam yet viridaya kumba, dvande pranama samis, ganadi raja. That's... Uh, Ganesh removes the obstacles on the path of devotional service. Back to Gajendra. He was an elephant, king of the elephants, but he got into a jam. Have anybody here ever been in a jam? <laughs> it happens. He got an alligator connected to his leg, which is very disconcerting and embarrassing, especially if you're a powerful an elephant or anyone else. It's uh, treacherous as well, because at any moment, uh, one could be dragged down into the water. Quite disconcerting. And these things come up for everybody in this lifetime. In fact, Kamala Dala Jala Jivana Talamala is a Bengali saying that we're all just on the verge of the next disaster. So Gajendra encountered this disaster even as he felt himself uh, impervious to any of the uh, troubles of life. He felt completely satisfied, happy. He was a little intoxicated. He was strong. Everyone respected him. He had a healthy family. He felt good about maintaining them. And then he was being dragged down in a helpless condition. And from that situation, he called out to the Supreme. And at that time, he didn't know who the Supreme was. He just knew that he needed to call out. And this is the natural instinct of especially human beings, because human beings have the ability to become aware not only of their, of their own selves, but also of the origin of their selves, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God. And even before they have any specific knowledge given to them through Scripture about who God is, there's a natural inclination to call out for God. In, in a situation where I feel myself helpless and I see impending danger, what will I do? 
oh my God, <laughs> please help me. And that's what Gajendra did. And he called out with such sincerity that the vibration reached the demigods, the devas, administrators of the universe, who are great powerful entities who sometimes like to avail themselves and help others. But they listened and they said, oh, that's not for us. We can tell it's for somebody higher. And then Lord Narayan heard it and he said, that's for me. And as Gajendra called out to the Supreme, something else happened. And this is consistent with the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita. And that is, as one endeavors to know God, even without any particular immediate guidance, knowledge of the Lord becomes concomitant. That is, Gajendra began to recollect whatever contact he had with the science of Krishna consciousness in a previous life, it became a, a, again visible in his heart. And he began to understand the details of the Supreme. This is one of the ways in which chanting with this kind of uh, prayerful mood, calling out for help, is immediately effective. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Tesham satata yuktanam pajitam priti purvakam dadami puti yogam tam yenamam upiyantite. To those who worship me with sincere endeavor, from within the heart, I give them intelligence how they can come to me. Similarly, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said, Vasudeve Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita Janaya Yashuvai Ragnam Jnanam Chayara Haitukam. When you perform devotional service, you get knowledge and detachment as a free gift. It comes to you naturally. It flows into your mental system, uh, coming from one's endeavor to serve the Lord. So this happened to Gajendra, and he got more specific knowledge of the Supreme as he called out. So by chanting the names of God, one gets everything. And if one chants with sincere feeling, then one becomes uh, uh, immediately open to the spiritual gifts that come from chanting, and one can realize them. And with those assets, one can steadily make advancement on the spiritual path, no matter what background one is from, no matter what religious tradition one is already following, one will find the immediate benefits of repeating the names of the Supreme in a mood of helplessness. So we can, um, we can try this. I don't see anybody here who can stop us. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> this is a, a traditional way uh, from the uh, followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to repeat the names of the Lord by this process called kirtan. So kirtan as performed by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his followers, uh, would include uh, a singer or a group of singers, three or four, who would in unison uh, sing out the names of God through a, a, a mantra. And then the, the, the rest of the assembly then would listen very carefully to the tune and to the, the words in the mantra and then repeat it back. And then this call and response there's a, a dynamic which is very powerful because one gets the benefit of the collective consciousness, the aggregate of all of the participants in the uh, kirtan. So we, shall we try it? Okay. I'm going to begin with a couple of invocation prayers. If you know them, you can sing them along with me. And then I'll begin the, uh, the mantra chanting with the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra which is recommended in the Kali Santaran Upanishad as the mantra specifically prescribed for the age of Kali Yuga that will remove all of one's obstacles. What's more, there are other descriptions of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra as the most esoteric of mantras. It has a very basic meaning, which is, O oh my Lord, O oh energy of the Lord, please engage me in your service. But our Vaishnava acharyas, or teachers, great masters of yoga and bhakti, have also given uh, deeper meanings to the words in the mantra, Hare Krishna and Rama, describing 
how uh, there's an interaction between uh, Krishna and his consort Srimati Radharani. And even without understanding the, the details of the mantra, uh, one will be able to experience the spiritual nature of it because it comes from a higher stratum. Human beings are social animals. You got to meet people. <laughs> With all this talk of spiritual practice, one might wonder, how do we balance things? After all, I have a lot of other obligations that seem to be part of my destiny. They're inevitable, practically. Sometimes when we talk about spiritual life, people think that it means to drop everything and run. And this is a mistaken idea that Krishna dispels quite quickly in the Bhagavad Gita when he's talking to Arjuna and tells him not to run away from his duty and at the same time be spiritual. So how does one do that? Well, there are ways and this is the very practical way to make advancement in spiritual life or in any discipline for that matter is to find out where you are now and then apply yourself appropriately at the time because one can't leapfrog and come to a level that one's not qualified for. One has to qualify oneself. And anyone at any level who's acting sincerely is considered to be practically uh, on an equal level in the sense of their endeavor is the same. And as long as one's endeavor, the Bhagavatam says, is sincere and uninterrupted, one will feel satisfaction in life. And even if one can only give a small part of one's time for intensive spiritual practice, or what we call direct practice of bhakti, which really entails shravanam kirtanam, which means hearing and chanting about Krishna. And there are various ways to do that, which we'll discuss. One will still be successful. For instance, we recently read in the Srimad Bhagavatam about uh, some, s the sons of Prachinabarhi, who was a great king. They're called the Prachetas. He had 10 sons. And they're very intelligent and spiritually inclined. They lived at a time in Satya Yuga when the Bhag Bhagavad history says people lived for 100,000 years. So they gave 10,000 years towards intensive meditation and practice of yoga underneath the water. They were great yogis. How much of a percentage of that is, uh, of their entire life is that? Engineers, mathematicians, 10%. So we have approximately how many years? Approximately 100. Unless you smoke or don't wear safety belts, then it goes down precipitously. <laughs> according to the actuary charts. So 100 years, if you use 10 years uh, very directly for bhakti yoga, you'll be right up there with the prachetas if you can apportion some of your life for this. If you make yogurt, which is a lost science, most people just buy it from the store, but in order to make yogurt, you need milk. And when you have the milk and you add a little bit of yogurt culture, just a little dab, and leave it in an environment that's favorable for the culture to grow, then overnight, you'll get a whole pot full of yogurt. So in a similar way, when you contribute a little bit in your life to direct spiritual practice every day, then the rest of your life, whatever that may be, taking care of your occupation, your professional life, your life with family, extended family, cousins, third cousins, fifth cousins, will also gradually become spiritualized by the effective process of bhakti yoga in one's life. Here are a few ideas about balancing one's life. And as soon as I figure out how to use this contraption, down button moves it ahead? Okay. And turn it on? Okay. It's on and down means forward. Good to know. 
Here's the definition of balance. An even distribution of weight enabling someone or something to remain upright and steady. Say, upright and steady. Yeah, we'd like to remain upright and steady throughout the various vicissitudes in our life. There are waves that come to us seemingly out of nowhere that want to knock us from side to side. There are natural disasters. There are economic upturns and downturns. There are various ways in which we're affected by the world. And how does one remain upright and steady throughout these various changes in life? One requires balance. So the word is broken into two. Bi means twice, and lanx means a scale pan. You've seen these before, where there's two flat plates. One of them gets a weight, and the other side gets a cauliflower. And you get to see <laughs> how much cauliflower you're taking home by putting it on the other side of the scale. So we have various sides to our life, how to balance them out. Balance also has the connotation of at the same time. Can you do various things at the same time and still be successful? Well, according to the Vedic Shastras, for instance, the Shriya Shupanishad, one of the oldest books on spiritual knowledge in the world, vidyam cha vidyam cha yas tadvedo bayam saha avidyaya mrtum tirtva vidyaya mrtum ashnute. Only one who can learn the process of transcendental knowledge and nescience side by side can transcend the influence of repeated birth and death and enjoy the full blessings of immortality. Is an advocation for keeping one's material and spiritual life going at the same time. Bhaktivinoda Thakur talks about two areas of responsibility that we all have. One is called the paramartika, which is our ultimate goal in life. And the other one has to do with our vyavaharika, with our obligations. What are some of them that you encounter every day? Go to work. Yes, work is inevitable when one's born into the world. That's why your parents save up for you before you're born for a, a college fund. Because as soon as you get out of the womb, they want to break the news to you. The little schnicky. <laughs> Welcome to the world. You're going to work hard, son. <laughs> because you've got a karmic debt to pay. Therefore, you have to work hard. The Krishna mentions this in the Bhagavad Gita. Every living entity has to work hard in order to maintain. So yes, this is an area of obligation, vyavaharika, that one must maintain to one degree or another. What are some other obligations that you feel that you have? Family. What do you have to do for your family? You have to care for them. How do you care for them? Emotionally? Uh, physically? Financially? Yeah. These are two very big obligations that we have in our life. What other things do you have to do? You got to eat. <laughs> you definitely have to eat. You have to sleep. So, what? You have to have electronics. You have to have the latest electronics. That's true. That's very true. So... How do you maintain all that? How do you keep those obligations going and maintain, and maintain your uprightness and steadiness in your life? It feels like that, doesn't it? Balancing so many things at the same time. So here are some tips. First of all is to realize that you're better than you think. You're always balancing. So let's try this. I need you to stand up just for a minute and get on a solid surface. If you're infirm in any way and you're, you've had exper experience of fainting or falling, then get a note from your doctor before you try this. <laughs> but I would like you now to... Uh, we have some yogis in the front who are showing off. Uh, I'd like you to just try for a minute to stand on one leg. You don't have to do the tree pose as you see in the picture there or as you see Vrindavan doing up front here. But just stand on one foot for a minute and see how it feels. Can you get your balance there, okay? Yes. 
You're all right? Okay, put your foot back down. Now take a deep breath. Relax. Get good posture. Now I want you to stand on one foot again. Now close your eyes. <laughs> Come on, stay up there now. <laughs> close your eyes. <laughs> all right, devotees are falling all over the place. Let's sit back down again. <laughs> it's not so easy. The point of this experiment is that when you have a point of reference for your life, it's much easier to balance. When you have a goal that you're looking at, you can tolerate so many things, the changes that come upon you. You're able to look straight forward and focus on what your purpose is. So you need vision. Everyone needs vision in their life in order to remain balanced. Those who do not have vision perish. So. One of my old friends, Will McCoy, Paramahamsa Das, wrote, goals are potent. When I first read this in a, a book of quotes, I thought, this is just so obvious and so simple. But then I thought about it because he's such a profoundly successful person in business and in life. His quote, goals are potent. I took it to heart and I started thinking more about it. So what does it mean, goals are potent? Well, it means goals are potent. And it means that if you simply fix your mind on a goal, then you'll find other energies that are unlocked in your life. So uh, one of uh, the uh, great inspirational speakers, Jim Rohn, once told how to do that. Decide what you want and write it down. There's something very uh, inspiring about writing it down. Oftentimes we have fleeting images of what our vision in life is. If somebody stops you on the way out tonight in the parking lot and has a clipboard and said, okay, what's your vision? Will you be able to sum it up? Will you be able to tell what your goals are right now for your life? Very specifically, that's a real question. I just changed it from a rhetorical question to a real question. You don't have to say what they are, but just tell me honestly, would you be able to say very specifically what your goals are if someone asks you in the parking lot? And can we have it a couple t uh, degrees cooler in here? Is it possible? Whatever it takes, we could pass out ice cubes. So, do you? No, not very specifically. So when you write it down, when you decide what you want and you write it down tonight, you will be a new person tomorrow morning. I guarantee you, if you take a few minutes, even if you don't write down everything, but if you write down a few of the things that you really want to accomplish in life, in your spiritual practice, in both sides of your life that you need to do or that you want to do, you write it down tonight and you put that little piece of paper right by your bedstand. When you wake up in the morning, you'll have extra energy because the human brain is like a heat seeking missile. It goes after goals, just like a missile goes after heat. So one of the ways that one can be more balanced and successful in life is to simplify. The simpler we keep our lives, the more focused we'll be on our particular goals. And the more clear we'll be about how we're moving forward in life. Stephen Covey once said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Everyone please say. Yes, the main thing is keep the main thing the main thing. Uh, he also said, don't major in minor things. There are so many minor things that come up in our life that we might get a PhD in them. But don't do that. Find out what the major things are, write them down, and concentrate on those to the exclusion of the minor things that tend to come into our purview whether we like it or not. They, they flood our environment.
So there's a little graph. Have you seen this before? When's the last time you saw it? A year ago? First of January. <laughs> It's a good idea to use these tools to simplify your life and to keep your goals in front of you. You have urgent and important things in your life. You have important and not urgent, and then you get a, a category of urgent and not important, and not urgent and not important. What goes into that category? Not urgent, not important. Gossip, somebody said Facebook. Unless you have a really good purpose for being on Facebook, which is a tool that can be used either for spacing out and wasting days of your life, years of your life. WhatsApp. WhatsApp, again, can be used as a tool for organizing a team, uh, for business pursuits, for spiritual life. What? Snapchat. Okay, we're hearing a lot about social media from this side of the room. <laughs> then I think you know what we're talking about, not or not important. You can at least be aware that it's in that category. And if you don't keep yourself aware of what category each one of the items that you're dealing with is in, then you may not be able to prioritize it properly. If you just let it spin and do whatever you want at any time, you may not be as productive as you could be. So keep this in mind. There are important and urgent things that you need to take care of. And if you don't take care of them right away, what might happen? Akurinath? He's an attorney, so he's always on a time schedule, and things have to be filed on time. And if they're not filed exactly on time, what happens? Give him the microphone. This is important. We have a bu bushel bucket of microphones. One of them is coming to a town near you. If you miss a deadline, yes, then um, can you hear okay? Yeah. So you can, um, you can lose your motion, you can lose an appeal, you can have your entire case dismissed, and then your clients can sue you for malpractice. Okay. <laughs> there's consequences when there's urgent and important items and you don't deal with them in the paramartic side of your life. It can throw off your spiritual life too because we find people who say, I don't have time to chant my rounds light right now because I forgot to file my motion, my taxes, my, what else? I forgot to pay the, 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 the electricity bill. I can't see a thing in here. I'd like to be on Skype, but I can't join you tonight. I mean, you do have to understand that there are consequences. Uh, spiritual life is holistic. You can't simply say, I'm just going to be spiritual and neglect various aspects of my life that are important and urgent. So, if you keep this grid on the back of your hand, in fact, if you get a tattoo, I recommend this one. <laughs> Put it on the back of your arm. And notice, what am I doing now? Is it urgent and important? Is it not urgent and important? Is it not important and urgent? Or is it not urgent and not important? If you just eliminate a few of the not important, not urgent items out of your life, then it'll free up time. And how much time do you get here in Silicon Valley? per day. Somebody said none. 24 hours a day. Just the same as everywhere else, right? So it's a matter of how you use it that, that counts. So here's also a way in which to prioritize the way you think about the world and the way you interact with it. There's a circle of influence that you have. What are some of the things that are within the circle of your own influence? Things that you can do every day that change your life, that you have uh, complete control over. Raise your hand and speak into the microphone. I want very specific answers, please. There's some, okay, Avantika? Your grades. Okay, there's a circle of influence, and how, how, how do you influence your grades? Don't they just happen by chance? Uh, <laughs> I wish, but you have to study. What? I wish, but you have to study. How much do you have to study to get an A? Uh, do you know how many hours? Have you figured it out? That if you put in this many hours, then you know you're going to do well. Probably three to four. 
for a test or paper? Yeah, a test. Okay, so you can figure it out. You can say that there's an, a direct correlation. I have an influence, um, a, a way in which I can influence the outcome by putting in a certain number of hours. What else? Yes. Your daily schedule. Your daily schedule. Can you be more specific, please? So, Circle of influence. Like, maybe you're going to have a class in the evening. Maybe you're going to do a Skype call. And if you decide to be lazy for one thing, you can end up postponing the call or whatever. Okay, you have, a, you have an influence over your schedule. You can decide what you're going to do during the day, and you're going to try to stick to that, right? Then there's the circle of concern. Are you concerned about various things in your life, in the world? Can you name a few of them? Let's hear a few concerns that you have. Things that keep you up at night, maybe. <laughs> jaguarini has got the microphone. Let's hear. Any concerns? Or are you perfectly passive and content? Um, no, not at all. Um, I'm concerned about the health care from Americans. Okay, anything you can do about that? Not much. No, nothing you can do about it. Anything, anybody else? <laughs> uh, Yes? The direction in which the world is going, I mean, without speaking. Well, that's a big one. The direction <laughs> in the world. Give us something more specific. What, uh, about what specific things in the world you might be concerned with specifically? Who said global warming? Animal. Yeah, global warming is something, it's a mantra we hear over and over again, and I can become so concerned with that. The, you, you'll see pictures of ice caps melting, polar bears with backpacks on heading <laughs> for the latest 7-Eleven so they can get in the refrigerator. I mean, there's, there, are, there are issues that loom large, and especially if you spend time on on the 24-hour news cycle, you'll see the most sensational photos because of those are the ones that sell. The ones that take you further adrift into your circle of concern. That's what's being sold through the various media companies. They want you to live there because you become more and more absorbed in that circle of concern and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. However, uh, if you go into that realm, you'll experience a lot of anxiety in your life because you'll have this constant tension that there's things happening beyond my control. But if you simply move into the inner circle, what can I do to affect the outcome of my life? For instance, spiritually, what can you do every day in order to fortify yourself against drifting into your circle of concern and being full of anxiety? Let's ask Srivast Pandit Prabhu. He has a very content look on his face, and he's a very steady person. <laughs> what can you do every day? Give him the microphone. Chanting a prescribed number of rounds every day. In a Tell us your personal experience of that and how it helps you. Over the years, um, I have struggled and uh, tried to bring my mind back and praying to Krishna to give me real attachment to the holy name so that and oftentimes I felt that if you seriously focus then you are out of your circle of concern because you have your mind is raising for so many things and if you suspend those then it's okay. really helpful. And Krishna gives us advice in the Bhagavad Gita Tasmat Sarveshu Kaleshu Mama Nusmarad Yujicha Mayarpita Manu Bhutir Mami Vaishyat Sisam Shayaha He says uh, he gives a therefore, that's what tasmat means, because he's described how important it is to mold your consciousness throughout your life so that you can depart this world in full consciousness of Krishna. And he says, therefore, you should use the time that you have now in order to think of me while you do your work, at the same time you do your work. And the way that uh, is specifically prescribed by Srila Prabhupada in the purport to do that is to take time to chant Hare Krishna every day so that you become fully aware of what is your circle of concern, what is your circle of influence. And this happens very naturally when you give a little attention to the ch uh, process of chanting Japa every day. You'll find uh, n causeless knowledge and detachment. Knowledge means you're able to see the difference between what's important and what's not. What's important is your soul, and what's not so important is your body. Body is going to go away very soon. It's already 
transitioning from one place, from one phase to another. As we sit here and speak, it's um, very transitory, whereas the soul is important. And you see that very clearly when you chant Hare Krishna. If instead of chanting Hare Krishna, you watch CNN all morning long, it, the process is reversed. You'll live in your circle of concern, and you'll forget about your circle of influence. And this is what causes anxiety and non-productiveness in life. So stay within your circle of influence by very specific targeted spiritual practice. And if you cover your basics every day, you'll find yourself fortified when you go out into the vast world where there's a lot of hard decisions to make and a lot of uh, issues that are very concerning, but you'll know the difference and know which ones not to touch. So the other tip is to develop good habits because good habits equal a balanced life. We are our habits. Whatever good or bad habits we develop will determine how much we're able to balance our lives. Uh, Kurnath, the other microphone? Could you read this out loud for us, please? The mic's on the way to you right now. Federal Express. He who is regulated in his habits of eating, sleeping, and recreation and work can mitigate all material pains by practicing the yoga system. Yes, so Krishna gives this recommendation. Don't eat too much, don't eat too little. Don't sleep too much, don't sleep too little. Regulating your habits, your daily habits of eating and sleeping and working and studying will make you very peaceful and it'll lead to a balanced life. So if you practice this, every day. For instance, if you wake up at a certain time every day, you'll find yourself in a very good state of mind. And if you wake up at the same time every day and you have a ritual through which you connect to spiritual vibration as soon as you wake up, then you'll have a good foundation to your day. And you'll be able to move forward in your circle of influence rather than your circle of concern. For instance, if you wake up early in the morning, then you'll be feel compelled to take rest earlier at night. Because of the invention, invention of the electric light bulb, human beings feel compelled to stay up later and later into the night. Why? Because you can. When it's very dark outside, for instance, if you've ever gone to a place where there's no electricity, anybody lived in a, in a village where there's no electricity? What time do people go to bed? After midnight? No. What time? Around 8 o'clock, whenever the sun goes down. Sun goes down, everyone goes, I give up. Sun's down, <laughs> let's go to bed. Maybe a little candlelight, which is not so um, caustic to the system. But the natural way of living, don't fidget in the front row, Vrindavan. Don't fidget. A little bit of uh, regulation in your sleep habits. If you wake up at a certain time every day, it'll start to calibrate your system. And then if you add your spiritual practice when you wake up in the morning. If you go to any ISKCON temple in the world, I just came from Tokyo, Japan. I'm living in the middle of the busiest city in the world. At 5.30 in the morning, we are dancing every day. Who else in Tokyo is dancing and singing at 5, 8, 5.30 in the morning? Not that many people, maybe none out of millions. But spiritual life gives you an opportunity to go deeply within your circle of influence every single day. And if you regulate yourself in the way that the acharyas, the great teachers, have prescribed, then you'll feel very confident about your approach to your life. And with this confidence, you'll be able to move forward in life without feeling any anxiety. Here's another habit that's very important. Everyone say, you are what you eat. Yes, indeed. Not just in body and mind, but also spirit. When you eat food in the mode of ignorance, you become ignorant. If you eat passionate food, you will become? If you meet, eat food in the mode of sattva or goodness, you will become good. And if you eat food that's transcendental, you'll become? It's a very simple science, but it's profound because this is one of the ways in which we're most affected by our environment. What we stuff in this hole in the front of our face every day has a huge effect. And 
eating right is a lot harder than it seems. It's a developed habit because the tongue has many demands. As we say in our prayer, Sharirad Vidya Jao Jodendriya Tahikal, people come running from all over the neighborhood. <laughs> That's the prayer we say before we eat. So everyone's like, now it's time for Prashadam, and the philosophy's over. So in that prayer, we say the tongue is the most voracious and difficult to control. And therefore, if you work on this, the Padma Purana says, if you work on this one area, it says, Atashi Krishna Namadi na Bhaved Grayamindri Sevun Mukihi Jihado Swayameva Spratida. If you just control the tongue and eat Krishna Prashadam instead of anything else, you'll notice a transformation in your consciousness. I just came from Govardhan Hill. I was there for four weeks straight, living in the Brahmachari Ashram. And every day we were very regulated. Every morning we have breakfast and we sit together in the Prashadam Hall at 9 o'clock, right on time every day, and they ring a bell. It's like Pavlov's, Pavlov's uh, experiments. They ring the bell, we think, time for Prashadam. We go sit down, and they'd serve us Prashadam, cooked with very high consciousness by a, a very advanced devotee who's uh, been cooking for many years, who uh, uh, practices spiritual life very intensely, is a transcendental personality, and so the consciousness goes into the food. And then he offers it to uh, Krishna and Balaram, who are there present at the ashram. And then it gets served out by uh, the resident uh, brahmacharis, who are also in very high consciousness. They're up early in the morning, chanting, dancing. And in that environment, when every day you take prasadam, breakfast, uh, lunch, all the devotees together, you feel that this is the most uplifting of spiritual activities. On the other hand, if you stop in at 7-Eleven and you grab yourself a bag of dot, 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 fill in the blank, and you just jam your hand into it while you're driving and cram it into your mouth, I'm not going to mention Cheetos or anything like that, but there are all kinds of foods that are processed, reprocessed, full of all kinds of chemicals, aren't offered to the Supreme Lord, aren't offerable to the Supreme Lord. And if you simply eat those kinds of things, then you'll notice a difference in your body, mind, and consciousness. So if you just adjust your diet as one of the habits in your life, you'll find that you become not only physically healthy, but you also become spiritually advanced just by eating. Speech, that's something that we do fairly frequently. In fact, at the Joppa retreats, there's a day in which everyone gets to not talk for one day. And before going to the Joppa retreat, it's the main concern of most of the participants that how am I going to make it through one full day without talking? But by the end of the day, people say, this was the most restful day of my life. I didn't have to talk to anybody, and I didn't have to figure out what to say when they talked to me. And it gives your mind a rest. And if you are careful with your speech, you'll find yourself less implicated in all kinds of problems in life. Therefore, Krishna recommends in the Bhagavad Gita, on the basis that your tongue is your rudder, it, dis it directs you in certain ways to be truthful. I had a man walk up to me on the street in New York, and he said, have you read the book Radical Truthfulness? And I said, no. And I just... I, did, I still haven't read it, but just the title of the book struck me, Radical Truthfulness. And your speech should be pleasing, should be beneficial. These are Krishna's words. Non-agitating, and you should also regularly recite the Vedas. This is something that you can be proactive with when you wake up in the morning, recite the Vedas. What are some things that you could recite? Sri Yusha Upanishad, very good. <laughs> We'll do that tonight. We'll recite together the Sri Upanishad because you all memorized it, right? Say yes. yes. Almost. If you recite the Vedas, you could recite the Bhagavad Gita. There are so many things to choose from that you like. You can compile your own list, and it doesn't have to be a lot. But if you do it, you'll find that the tongue moves in that way, and then it reprograms your brain in spiritual ways. One sentence of pure encouragement can have a profound effect for a lifetime. So what we say has an effect both on the people around us and on, and on ourselves, the way in which we say things. 
Also, what are you listening to? This is something that you can check into. Take an inventory of what you listen to during the regular course of the day. And if you don't like the way your life is going, you can change the topics that you're listening to and your consciousness will follow. This is a picture of a storm drain in my neighborhood in Burlingame, which is fairly far away from the San Francisco Bay. But every storm drain in the Barrier has one of these little emblems that say, no dumping. In a similar way, I was thinking as I walked by this, my ears are like these storm drains. And whatever I put into them drains to the bay of my heart. So you have to be careful. If you dump here, you're going to end up agitated in your mind and heart. So don't dump. Be careful what you put in. The human body is a very finely tuned technological instrument. And it's specifically meant for taking in spiritual sound. Now, if you put in material sound again and again, it's going to break down the system really quickly. You'll get depression. You'll get all kinds of uh, misguided thoughts. Your body will become weak. Spiritual sound, on the other hand, will boo you. It will bring you up to a higher level. If you watch television, you'll take in what other people think you should be listening to. And it's non-Vedic sound. It's sound that will actually degrade your consciousness. It will put you in loops of stories that have nothing to do with transcendence. And it will be very difficult for you to break those loops, even at the time of death. So don't dump. Be very specific and deliberate about what you allow to go in the ears. That's what human life is specifically meant for, is shruti, or hearing from the higher sources, the transcendental sources. Careful. Aha, there it is, social media exposure. This is a very specific point because it's so widespread nowadays. Look at all those ways in which the mind can space out into unlimited topics. As Krishna says in the Gita, bahu shaka hyanantascha. There are unlimited ways in which the mind can be divided and diverted from spiritual knowledge and intelligence and topics. And be careful about all of the uh, various ways in which uh, you can be exposed through these social media outlets. Another very important part of our life is relationships. So there is a concept of the spiritual bank account. Those you live among, those you live with, you should be very much aware that they're dependent upon you emotionally. And consider that every person that you live with, that you relate to, has a bank in their heart. And if you would like to have a good relationship then be sure to make deposits in the emotional bank account of those that you're in relationship with. Because at certain times, you're going to have to make withdrawals. Has anybody had to make a withdrawal in their account? Do you want to tell us about it? Anyone? <laughs> yes? Sometimes you make withdrawals. Could you give a scenario, not about yourself, but about a fictitious entity? how something might happen. You got one? Give him the mic. To buy a car? Yes? You make a withdrawal. What do you mean? Like you buy a car behind your spouse's back and then... <laughs> It was not about the relationship, it was about the bank account and taking out the money. Oh, okay. The, I'm, what I'm talking about is you're in a relationship with somebody, a friend, a spouse, an associate, and you have to make an emotional withdrawal. In other words, you might do something that takes away from your relationship, that might ordinarily compromise your relationship. What might that something be? Work with me, people. Come on, what is it? Yes. Could I give an example from the scripture? Yeah. So uh, this was uh, yesterday I heard about this. Like when uh, Sita was, uh, when Ram had gone for the, uh, behind the golden deer and uh, he, Maricha shouted out his name. Sita asked La Lakshman to go but he didn't go and then finally she shouted at him and he went. Later on uh, somebody asked him, actually Ram asked him or something, that uh, 
<coughs> you know, Lakshman generally is very zero or one person, so he gets ang angry quickly, but here he did not. Why was the question? So then the answer was that during the 20 years when, when before, uh, Sita had emotionally deposited a lot in him. So right now at this point when she made the withdrawal, like she scolded him, he did not get angry because of the emotional uh, balance that she had already put in. Give him a hand. Very nice. If you make it your business to make deliberate deposits, you'll find that when there's an inevitable withdrawal, that you won't overdraw. And this keeps you steady and balanced in your relationships. It's a very simple technique, but it's very profound and it works very well. And oftentimes you'll find it's small things that make the biggest difference. Bali Mardan has another example. And he's in the back, so get him the microphone quick. So even in uh, Srila Prabhupada's uh, memories, when he tells someone, his disciples, let's say, Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj, to go to China, he was surprised, likely, whether he should go, but they, they've been to China because of his order, because they had deposited their trust, their faith in the commandment of the words of Srila Prabhupada. If you say someone, Brahmananda, to go to Pakistan, and he is already there in Pakistan and Prabhupada saw that there is a turmoil. So the point is, definitely it is a relationship between the disciples and the teachers that has a bondage, a strong bondage to execute the order of the will. Yes, thank you very much. Be very uh, proactive when it comes to this. So beware of grabbers. There are people that will grab your attention, they'll, they'll interfere with your practices and you have to be aware of those people in your life who are taking you away from your steady practice your balance in life and you have every right in the world to avoid such grabbers now perception is very important uh, it's one of the ways in which through spiritual practice we develop we do develop a more keen sense of perception so perceive Per means entirely, and capere means to take. So we take in things from our environment. So when we perceive, we become aware or conscious of something. For instance, I am my car versus I drive a car. This is a very profound difference, but it is a fundamental aspect of spiritual life to, to be able to direct our perception to see that things belong to Krishna. I'm simply using things. I'm only passing through this world. And one of the techniques given in the scriptures for becoming spiritually advanced, this is a practice, is neglect. Neg means not, and legere means to choose to pick up. There are certain things in our environment that we don't need to pick up, and we should give them tender, loving neglect. So what's valuable in your life? If you're going to choose during a fire, if your house were burning down, uh, which thing would you go for first? Pet, pet. pet, why? It's not a car costs more than a pet. <laughs> huh? Give him the mic, he needs to explain himself. The parakeet only costs like $10. Well, there are living things while like car, money, furniture, it's not. Aha, uh -huh. I think we're on to something here. The pet has life. So there's a way we naturally prioritize between material and spiritual things. When it comes to a great crisis, we'll notice that people are going away on a boat from the flood in their house and they're carrying their pet with them under their arm. And they save their kids obviously first before they go and try to find their expensive watch collection and so forth. So this is a perception. We pick up those things which are most important. And as we're practicing spiritual life, chanting Hare Krishna, we become more aware of which things are most valuable in our life, and therefore we're able to give more attention to those things. Remember that early on and do it regularly, and you'll have more success in your life. Don't just do it when the emergency comes. Checking the boxes off. We came to pet. Okay. There they are. <laughs> so th the other 
aspect that becomes strengthened in our life as we practice is our discipline. And the word discipline comes from a Latin word which means learner. As we're disciplined, we actually open ourselves up to learning and to becoming advanced in life. Krishna says that the unbridled mind becomes a source of trouble for us. So when we discipline our minds, then we open ourselves to deep spiritual knowledge. And the third, first is perception, second is discipline, and the third is contentment. Now work with me now. Perception, <laughs> discipline, <laughs> contentment. Okay, now you do it. Yeah, this spiritual practice, you'll notice that you're reaching higher levels of perception. That means what you're picking up, what you're leaving behind. Discipline, which means you become a learner. You actually learn from your environment. And contentment, higher levels of contentment. Would you like that? Yes. Say yes. Everybody say yes. yes. You would like that. Okay, so contentment. Interestingly, the word container, con, altogether, tenere, what you hold. What are you holding inside? This determines your level of contentment. What do you keep? What do you, you are a vessel. What are you walking around with inside of you right now? If it's CNN, you may not feel so content. If it's the spiritual vibration and you're thinking of Krishna, as Krishna says in the Gita, manmana pavamad bhakto, no matter where you go, you'll feel content. Because that's what you're carrying. It's what's inside of you that counts. So your happiness in life. Do you have a happiness plan? Lave your, lay, raise your hand if you have a specific happiness plan chalked out that you can show me on a piece of paper. Okay, you show me afterwards. I want to see it. If you don't have a happiness plan, get one. Otherwise, you'll have to pick up someone else's. Uh, in order to have happiness, you have to achieve higher levels of perception, discipline, and contentment through practice called a bias, which increases your appreciating capacity, your ability to appreciate your environment. And to, this requires practice. So practice means start by doing what is necessary, then what is possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. St. Francis of Assisi said this. And prioritize what's on your schedule. So otherwise, if you don't have your own priorities and you don't have your own happiness plan, you could take this one. Okay? Is this a good plan? What is this plan anyway? Sugar water? Is that a good happiness plan? Anybody here tried that one? Just drink. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay could do an experiment for a month just drink coca-cola most of the day instead of water see what happens do you get happy no. not really and they're all this is this is emblematic of the kind of happiness that's offered in the world I took this picture you can see my reflection there as I was walking through the airport <laughs> moments of timeless pleasure Ghirardelli chocolate I mean what if you just combine the two you could have this and that all day long happiness yes Yes? No. Yes? No. Okay. All right. So if you don't have a happiness plan, you're going to have to take one of these because there's all kinds of suggestions. These are very obviously uh, substandard, to say the least. But you'll take one or another happiness plan that somebody else will suggest for you if you don't have a very specific happiness plan. So here's a limited way to look at the world. The world is an opportunity for my enjoyment. This doesn't work according to the Srimad Bhagavatam. But here's the other way. Unlimited. The world is an opportunity for service. If you just adju adjust your attitude and you think, how can I serve? How can I serve Krishna and the devotees? You'll have opportunities everywhere you go and you become happy. And the other plan for happiness as given in all the Vedic scriptures is by mantra. The, the mantra that you deliberately speak every day will either elevate or degrade your consciousness. So this is the Maha Mantra. Everyone say, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Try this every day for 30 days instead of the bottle of Coke or the Ghirardelli chocolate and see if this doesn't help advance your happiness plan. 
focus on the lesson of life. When things happen to you, try to find out what's the lesson in this for me. Don't become tipped over. Don't get out of balance when all sorts of adversities come into your life. Instead, be an essence seeker and say, what is the lesson I'm being taught here? This is how you become mature and happy and balanced, is you take lessons rather than simply seeing the superficiality of the situation and becoming disturbed by it. What is that? Focus on the life lesson. Everyone say. Focus on the life lesson. Good, that'll be on the test. So we thank you very much for your kind attention. And now we'll take your reflections. That means anything you heard in this presentation that's stuck in your mind, anything that you're taking away from here in your pocket, when you walk out of here, besides being interviewed in the parking lot about your goals in life, what is your vision, and being able to have a ready answer because you wrote it down, what is the one thing that you'll say that you took away from this mini seminar today? And if a person grabs you by the arm and says, what was that guy talking about there? You'll say what? Okay, now I'm smarting him. Hare Krishna Maharaj. I really liked uh, the point that decide what you want and write it down because mind goes after the goals. Yeah, get yourself a piece of paper. It's amazing how this happens. It can even be a scrap piece of paper. Once you write it down and you put it somewhere near your uh, vision, you'll notice it calls to you again and again. And when all kinds of other impulses come into your mind to go here, there, look at this and that, then your very specific item that you've written down on the piece of paper will take prominence because you took the trouble to write it down. Everything we have in our life we've manifested because of what's inside our heart. We manifest things in our life because we're little creators. And whatever situation I have right now, I've created for myself. I've created this body, in fact. This is called prarabdha. It's a full manifestation of what I've done previously. This is what I get. So if you want something different, be very deliberate. Decide what you want and? Write it we didn't get it. Decide what you want and? Write it down. Correct, write it down. Then you're manifesting from the subtle to the gross because the subtle thoughts are going through your mind and you'll think of your purposes in life as you're doing other things, washing the dishes, driving your car, and you don't do anything about it. And 20 years later, it's still looping around, right? And you still don't do anything about it. How many more years after that? 50 years? I'm 70 years old. I still haven't done anything about it. Then I'm how old? 82. Doctor tells me, you got six years left to live, sir. And then still, I don't do anything about it. Do it now. Write down what is your purpose. Take a moment to define. If you want to be very... Uh, Deliberate about it, get a legal pad. And sit down with a pen. Put a do not disturb sign on, the, on your door and on your mind. And sit there and think, what do I really want? And write it down. And once you write it down, you'll have a clear path. Your mind will start to follow that path because you're very deliberate about it. And this is the exciting aspect of being a human being. You can decide at any time to redirect your life, to recollect your thoughts and your intentions and to go in a certain direction. Okay, what else? Yes. Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you for the wonderful class. Uh, one point that I found very interesting is uh, we have to be careful with our speech. So, uh, as it said, uh, everything you like give can be returned, but what you say to others that cannot oh, be returned. Oh yeah, it's like unringing so, a bell, right? Yeah, so, and you mentioned the five points which is in the uh, Bhagavad Gita, like being truthful and pleasing, then beneficial, non-hesitating, and uh, regularly reciting the Vedas. And you also mentioned that if you regularly recite the Vedas and listen to the mantras, then, uh, you know, all other things will automatically fall into line. So true. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, when we were in Govardhan this year, we were spending a del a very specific amount of time every day hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, reading in a, in a group of devotees. And at night, I'd sit down with a couple of devotees and we'd recite from various prayers from the Srimad Bhagavatam, same ones every night. 
And one of the devotees of Brahmachari said, you know, it's amazing. After about four days of reciting these, they start to come to me in my mind as I'm walking around. And after a week, after two weeks, full sentences start to come in. And then after you do it for two months, then the full verses start to come into your mind. And as you go deeply within them, you'll find that there's so much rich meaning to each one of them that helps direct your consciousness. And if you rely on these mantras and imbibe them, imbibe means to drink, you drink them in through your ears, then your life will improve because your life is dependent on good ideas. And the best ideas come from scripture. And if you regularly ingest those, you take them in every day, every day, every day, then what happens is your mind, intelligence, your heart will all be directed in the right way. What else? One, two, three. One, two, three. I like the point where you said to perceive and then discipline and the contentment. So do it. Stand up and do it. So we all remember how to do that. Perceive, discipline, contentment. That's right. Everyone try it now. By practicing spiritual life, you will develop higher levels of perception, discipline, and contentment. Yes. And so if you're teaching Krishna consciousness to others and they would like to know the list of benefits from, for instance, chanting Hare Krishna and reading Bhagavad Gita, what will you tell them? You'll get higher levels of? Correct. Yes. I like the point where you said that if you want to live a happy life, you, you, have, um, you have to do it full of service. So in my personal experience, when I like do service in the temple, when close. I do service in the temple, like rake the leaves, clean the temple, I go home like I'm content. Um, I'm happy that I did at least like something. Very nice. Yes, this is a good point. When you do, do service for service, there's a kind of happiness that you can't get anywhere else. And uh, this is a very practical thing because we're meant for service. And when we do service specifically we do for Krishna, then we feel a natural satisfaction. Um, I like the chart with the important and um, urgent activities. What struck you about it? Like, there are so many activities that are not important or urgent, and then you can disclude them so you have more time. Nice. Yeah, it's good to be able to prioritize and then decide that this is not important and it's not urgent, and let it go. Or it's urgent but not important, and let it go, right? Very good. Bali Mardan Prabhu. I think I like the, the quote, for, I forgot the name, what is it? The main thing is the main thing of main thing. What's the main thing is keeping the main thing the main thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I, I remember um, when uh, my dad visited here a long time ago, he, he will always focus on unimportant things like me. anybody will steal my chapel like shoes. <laughs> in Bahawai, we have to say it's Silicon Valley, it's not like India people because he knows it but still some unimportant things which dwells and we have to discuss for an hour so I think <laughs> <laughs> so it's the main thing we really need to bring our mind otherwise it drives crazy. That's yeah. The, don't major in minor things. And remember that. Just uh, move on. And you'll find very sober, serious, strict devotees are very careful to keep focused on what the main things are. And they build it into their schedules. This is what Rupa Goswami's advice is. Build your schedule around your main things. It's your schedule. Some people say, I don't have any choice. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You have 24 hours and you're a free spirit. You can do whatever you want. You may have to do it incrementally, but you can definitely do what you want. So you have to recreate your life by reordering your schedule. And if you reorder your schedule to include those things which are uh, most fundamentally spiritually nourishing, you will definitely notice, even in the first day, a change in your consciousness and your attitude and your happiness in life and your ability to deal with adversity and to be able to stay within your circle of influence. Yes, um, I'd wait. Uh, I was taking notes and something that stuck to me was uh, good habits e makes a balanced life. Yeah, that's right. I, I really liked that point. Yeah, what did you like about it? What struck you about it? Um, I don't know, it just like, I've never thought about that before. It's practical though, isn't it? 
It's very practical because sometimes when we talk about concepts like a balanced life, it seems so far away, so unattainable. But if you look at developing good habits and make a, look at the science of developing good habits, for instance, if you want to be healthier, one of the ways you can be healthier is to move around. The body's meant to move. It's not meant to sit all day. So what could you do? You could decide, I'm going to move more. So if you start by moving from one side of the room to the next, that's a start. And now there's ways of measuring. Your watch will tell you, stand up now, breathe now. You might just walk around the block once, and you start the process. You develop a new habit, and then that will begin to edge out the bad habits. Also, a point about habits is whatever good habits you develop will have a ef systemic effect on the rest of your life. And whatever bad habits you develop will have a systemic effect on the rest of your life. Don't just think, I let down in this one area. Actually, when you let down in one area, it'll affect the other areas. And if you lift up one area, your attitude will change and you'll become more attentive to other areas of your life. I'd wait, thank you for that. Boom. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Um, what I really could reflect with was the, the elephant picture. And I was imagining myself and uh, the plastic ball. Uh, the elephant is so heavy and it's standing on a plastic ball. And I felt that we have so many priorities in life. Uh, being in Silicon Valley job, children. Um, then we have to do Bhakti Shastri, we have to do chanting. So how do we you know, balance it out? So I could totally relate to it because the over endeavor that we do sometimes with respect to our jobs and uh, sometimes with children and their activities uh, affects the chanting or affects your studies. So um, I really appreciated all the things that you shared because it helped me develop it more, made, make my conviction more strong that the balance is so important. Yeah, it's very practical because we're all challenged by many different options in life and obligations. And it can feel overwhelming sometimes. And it's important to uh, find out ways in which we can deal with that incrementally so we don't feel overwhelmed. One of the ways I've found in my life is to make sure that I cover the most important basics every day as well as possible. Because if you care for those items that have the most direct effect on you spiritually, then it will tend to, to make all the other things easier to deal with. And so find out what your lowest common denominator is. In other words, find out what is the level I won't go below. That's why we have what we call uh, numerical strength. For instance, for initiated devotees, we say 16 rounds. That's minimum. So what does that mean? Someone say, I don't have time for 16 rounds every day. So what does that mean? It means you have different priorities in life. It doesn't mean you don't have time for 16 rounds. But if you incrementally increase your rounds and you say, okay, I do 16 rounds every day. That's who I am. That's what initiation means. That's what defines me, my vow. Then everything else has to make room for that. And when that happens, you'll find that your life is in, uh, set in the proper priority, line of priority, and also, you become more productive in every area of your life. Because a mind full of chaos, worrying about things beyond your reach, and that you're not spiritually equipped to deal with, is simply a life of anxiety and depression. So covering basics every day before you do other things is uh, highly effective. Oh, goodness. We have five minutes left. Okay. One, two, three. Anybody else over here? Four, five, six. Okay. <laughs> Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, but make it brief, we got five minutes. I was just thinking, like, whatever we oh, put I in I should our make it brief, <laughs> look who's talking, go ahead. <laughs> whatever we put in, a, in our ears drains to the bay because we don't get to talk to people to get guidance, but hearing throughout the day on spiritual topics helps, more, makes us more healthy, and we get the instructions Absolutely. through those lectures. Yes. No dumping drains the bay. Yes. I like the statement you made. There are consequences, so we should mold our consciousness accordingly. Absolutely. Think about the consequences. Yes. Focus on the life lesson. Focus on the life lesson. Yes. 
This is Tate Anu Kampam Susumikshamanu Bunjane Vatmakritam Vibhakam. It means the devotee is looking always, what's Krishna trying to teach me by this? He's not feeling a victim. He's feeling, oh, Krishna's so kind. He just taught me another lesson. He took away this or he moved me on this side to that side. Yes, who's next? Yes. I like the comparing uh, how you put uh, a little bit of culture in the milk, then it becomes a yogurt. So the same like when you uh, put attention to your spiritual life, then all other areas becomes of your life become spiritualized. Exactly. So it gives, uh, helps to focus on the right That's things. right. Little dab will do you. Yes. I was just wondering, both uh, Srimad Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, they both embody the principles of perception and then discipline and then contentment. Oh, in they such a remarkable ways. If you take time to read, if you want to really change your life in a profound way, take more time to hear from Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. That's all that's required because it reorders your, your mind and your heart and consciousness just by hearing. You don't have to do anything else. That's how wonderful the process is. Yeah, I mean, both, both had a perception of, you know, one is like they're going to die in seven days, the other one like in a very difficult situation. And they became a disciple, one with the Supreme Lord, another with the devotee of Supreme Lord. Yes. And they were both contented at the end, basically. Yes. Very good. There was a couple more. Yes. I like the point about withdrawing from the emotional uh, bank balance. Yes. So it reminded me of the story of Loknath Goswami and Narottam Das Thakur. That uh, Narottam Das Thakur served Loknath Goswami man uh, manually and secretly for so many days and months that at last he was compelled to give him in initiation. Very nice. Yes. Keep making those deposits. Okay. Uh, oh, look, SKP's here for the last point. Get him the mic quick. Hare Krishna, the mention you about the shlokas reciting in the morning, which stays all night, uh, that's really true proverb. I, I tried uh, with the Srimad Bhagavatam third canto, where uh, uh, Devahuti and Kapil Dev, you know, the recitation of Sadhu. So it just keep coming in the night also, as you mentioned, it's very profound reciting the Vedas in the morning. Yes. Or Bhagavatam especially. Thank, Thank you. you for recalling that. And that we have so much available to us. Pick something and stick to it, and you'll find. When I first joined the ashram in San Francisco, there was a young brahmachari there that every day would recite the third chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which are the incarnations of the Lord. He didn't know Sanskrit or how to pronounce it, but he would read the English every day, and he memorized the whole thing just by saying it every single day. And it says at the end of that, anyone who recites this in the morning and the evening will become free from all the anxieties of life. So he said, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> Small price to pay. Morning and evening, he would just recite it. And he enlivened the entire atmosphere with to speak of himself. So all this is within reach. It's all possible. And it can be done uh, by incremental improvements in our life by following these few basic principles that are given to us through Scripture. And we thank everybody for taking the time to improve their lives, all of you for improving your lives, because as Prabhupada writes in the Anjalila of the Srimad, of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, he asks every one of his followers to please come to the point of becoming pure devotional, pure devotees of the Lord so that you can help all the other people of the world go back to Godhead even without their knowledge, just by your influence. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai, Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Gaur Bhaktivinda ki jai, Gaur Premanande, Nitai Gaura Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Nitai Gaura Hari Bo, Nitai Gaura Hari Bo, Bo, Hari Bo, Nitai Gaura Hari Bo. Got to stop right on time. Ditai Goda Hari Bo.
we're getting there. Vancha kalp the rusha kripas nebe vicha patitanam pavani bio vishnave bio namo namaha. Thank you. Not to the Not to the Not to the Not to the